Hello, and welcome to the digital launch of the Eric Williams Memorial Lecture in its new home, the John L. Warfield Center for African and African American Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. My name is Jennifer Wilkes, and I have the honor of serving as director of the Warfield Center. Established at Florida International University in 1999, the Eric Williams Memorial Lecture honors the late Dr. Eric Williams, scholar, statesman, and head of the government of Trinidad and Tobago from 1956 until his death in 1981. Among numerous books, Williams authored Capitalism and Slavery, published in 1944, the landmark study that has been translated into 10 languages and that is still widely read today. In the University of North Carolina Press edition of Capitalism and Slavery, Colin Palmer, late of Princeton University, describes the book as follows, quote, few modern historical works have enjoyed the enduring intellectual impact and appeal of Eric Williams's Capitalism and Slavery. It is a work of conceptual brilliance, intellectually mature, bold, incisive, and immensely provocative. Its publication marked an important watershed in the historiography of the Caribbean, but its ramifications extended beyond the Caribbean. Williams established the centrality of African slavery and the slave trade to the English economy. His conclusions may be rejected, but no serious scholar can avoid confronting the important questions the book poses." End quote. In a similar vein, Duke University professor William Darity has stated that with capitalism and slavery, Williams, quote, managed to produce a work that now has to be considered central in the historiography of slavery and abolition, end quote. The Eric Williams Memorial Lecture continues in this legacy by hosting conversations about global activism and art from Williams's time to the present. The series has moved to UT Austin with the generous support of co-founders Erica Williams Connell and Dr. Carol Boyce Davies in collaboration with Warfield Center affiliates, Drs. Lorraine Liu and Minka Makalani. Daughter of the series namesake, Williams Connell is the founding curator of the Eric Williams Memorial Collection at the University of the West Indies, Trinidad, and Tobago. Boyce Davies was a professor of African Diaspora Studies and English at Florida International University, and is currently Frank H.T. Rhodes Professor of Humane Letters in the College of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Africana Studies and English at Cornell University. The Warfield Center is marking the occasion by curating a collection of interviews with Williams Connell, Boyce Davies, and previous lecture speakers. These conversations are streaming in conjunction with a digital exhibition celebrating Eric Williams, co-coordinated between the Eric Williams Memorial Collection and UT's Black Diaspora Archive. The digital launch begins with Living the Legacy from Trinidad and Tobago and Beyond, a conversation with Erica Williams Connell and Dr. Arnold Rampersad. Many thanks to my colleague, Dr. Lorraine Liu, for moderating this dynamic exchange, and to Warfield Center Events Coordinator, Justice Madden, for bringing us all together. Finally, thank you for joining the Warfield Center community as we celebrate the legacy of Eric Williams, reflect on the lecture series history at Florida International University, and prepare for the inaugural UT-based lecture in spring 2022. Hello, my name is Lorraine Liu, and I'm a faculty affiliate of the Warfield Center for African and African American Studies. Today, I have the pleasure of initiating a series of events to launch the Eric Williams Memorial Lecture here in its new home at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm honored to facilitate a conversation between two people who have been living Dr. Williams' legacy in quite different ways. Erica Williams Connell is the daughter of the late Eric Williams, 
renowned historian and Trinidad and Tobago's first prime minister. She directs the Miami office of the Eric Williams Memorial Collection Research Library, Archives and Museum at the University of the West Indies, Trinidad and Tobago. It was inaugurated in 1998 and named to UNESCO's Memory of the World Register in 1999. Williams Connell regularly lectures at conferences on her father to international students and groups and was a professor in the Black Exchange Executive Program at Florida Memorial College, as well as a participant in a recent Black World Seminar at John Hopkins University. Williams Connell's writing have appeared in several collections, including Eric E. Williams Speaks, edited by Selwyn Cujo and published by the University of Massachusetts Press, and the 2004 reissue of The Economic Future of the Caribbean, edited by Eric Williams and E. Franklin Frazier, that was published by the Majority Press. She was also a contributor to a dossier on Eric Williams in the Journal of African American History in 2003, and to the conference proceedings of Eric Williams, his scholarship, work, and impact, organized at the Schomburg Center in 2002. She has also authored two entries for the Encyclopedia of African American History and Culture. Welcome, Erica. Arnold Rappasad was born and grew up in Trinidad and is the Sarahat Kimball Professor Emeritus in Humanities at Stanford University. An award winning biographer and literary critic, his books have profiled W.E.B. Du Bois, Langston Hughes, Jackie Robinson, and Ralph Ellison. His awards and honors are many, too many to, to name here, but they include a Lifetime Achievement Prize from the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards, finalists for the Pulitzer Prize in Biography, fellowships from the MacArthur Foundation and the Guggenheim Foundation, the Harvard University Graduate School of Arts and Sciences Centennial Medal, and the National Humanities Medal presented at the White House in 2011. Professor Rampasad holds honor, an honor, several honorary doctorates, in fact, from Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and the University of the West Indies, among others. He's an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. A colleague at Stanford once described him in this way, an extraordinarily elegant writer, a meticulous researcher, and a scholar gifted with the ability to focus on what matters most about any subject that he tackles. It is a great pleasure to have both of you with us today in this opening conversation about the life and work of Eric Williams. Welcome to our virtual UT Austin space. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I want to start uh, by talking about the overall legacy of Dr. Williams. Uh, the late Jamaican intellectual Stuart Hall once said that colonialism others us to ourselves, that it bequeathed to us that most soul-destroying of legacies, <clears throat> the alienation from who we are or who we might be, right? that condition of feeling negated, of being secondary. I myself like to think about Eric Williams' intellectual and political legacy overall as providing Caribbean and diasporic peoples with the tools to confront that alienation from ourselves, to find ways to refuse and to resist that subservience. So I wanted to pose that question to the two of you uh, in terms of what you see as his greatest overall legacy. And Eric, if you'd like to kick us off. Sure, well, I, I've never heard it more poignantly expressed than in Arnold's own quote about Eric Williams's political education lectures at a park in Trinidad that he renamed the University of Woodford Square. This is what Arnold said. He made us proud to be who we were and optimistic as never before about what we were going to be or could be. That I think is his greatest legacy. I've never heard it expressed like that, and I cannot uh, improve on that expression. Arnold, she's taking the words out of your mouth. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I had to, but that, that's how I feel. <laughs> it, it does, her words uh, do take me back to 
my boyhood um, when I was 14 or 15 and Dr. Williams appeared on the scene for us. He'd been on the scene uh, long before then for all sorts of grown-up people, but for a person of my age going to St. Mary's College out of Green Hill Village in Diego Martin and uh, always a reader. Um, so I knew something about you know, Caribbean writing, Trinidadian writers, uh, uh, I knew Derek Walcott, uh, V.S. Naipaul and others. And, but still, I mean, there was such a sense of blankness almost about uh, the way we saw ourselves, aside from, you know, from the obvious triumph of something like the Calypso or the Sea Land and, and, and such. And suddenly on the scene came Eric Williams and, and these lectures um, were being delivered in Woodford Square and we all would sort of flock down to uh, to stand and, and, and listen to what he was uh, teaching us really about ourselves, about the world, about history. And, um, and I just thought that uh, the, the world turned upside down on its head at that point and that we were on the way to something that we had no idea previously that we were motioning towards. So for me, he was the beginning of, of uh, my grown up life, um, uh, certainly as a thinker, as, as, as a scholar, um, and as a would be scholar. Uh, and um, and I, I don't think that he has, he has lost that preeminence really um, in, in terms of being an educator and an example for thinking uh, Trinidadians, West Indians uh, then. I think your story speaks to that real legacy that's impossible to separate with him of the political and the intellectual. And it, uh, it takes me back to that repeated um, statement quote from him that said, to educate is to emancipate. And I think- Can I, can I just jump in a minute? Um, he, uh, he dubbed these lectures as uh, university lect style lectures served with political source. And um, I just like to read you what very briefly, I don't know if I'm gonna be you know, blank from the screen, what um, the British, uh, of course we were still a colonial people, what the British felt about these lectures. So this is what, is, this is what the, the British High Commissioner at the time, Sir Norman Costar, this is what he said about the, University of Woodford Square. His public outbursts in Woodford Square arouse interest as theatrical performances. There is no live theater in Port of Spain, and Dr. Williams's speeches are rated high as entertainment by those for whose benefit they are uttered. And just listen to this other British official who was even more disparaging. His name was R. L. Baxter. And he wrote in 1958 that he had found the chief minister's speech, meaning Eric Williams, a queer mixture of scholarly exposition and demagogic invective, ending with a parody of the New Testament that smells unpleasantly of Africa. Ooh. How do you figure that one? <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that unbelievable? That is unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. That's the reaction to the, the global south rising up, I think. Yes, indeed. But it really points to that nexus of, of um, <coughs> and performativity. That was a really that was the source of his power, right? His, his abilities as an orator, as somebody who inspired and motivated, uh, were really crucial to, to his success in, in disseminating a message at a time, obviously, when we didn't have social media and the internet and, you know, basic technologies. I was thinking yesterday about how um, when those lectures were being delivered, Trinidad did not have television, uh, which came in 1962, exactly. about 55, 56. Um, and therefore you had to, if you really wanted to, to, to sort of get a good sense of the occasion, you had to go there and you went there and you stood and listened to a man who was always, I think, a teacher, a, a scholar. He never surrendered in the way that uh, those two uh, British uh, critics or observers 
um, disparagingly said to, to the theatrical, but he did know his audience. He was Trinidadian and he did bring a certain flair uh, to, um, to the business of, of teaching that, um, that people recognized at once. Uh, when I say people, I mean the, the masses of people in front of him recognized at once was something that, that they could not do without, that they had to live by, that, that set new challenges for them, for the nation as a whole. And, um, and I, I, I think uh, it, he, was, he was a phenomenon, really, that, uh, that we could hardly have anticipated, given the kind of politicians we had had to, to, uh, to that point. So, uh, I feel even a little bit of resistance uh, to myself calling him a politician, because he was that, but he was, uh, there was nothing, no one like him before. And, and I would say no one like him since, certainly not in, in, in Trinidad in the Caribbean. And that, are you thinking about when you talk about the way he would speak to the public? Uh, I think what those British critics are, are pointing towards as well is this, I mean, he is, has this capacity for intellectual leadership, intellectual production at the highest level, and yet this uh, vernacular idiom when he's talking to, as you say, to his people. So it was a way of, of telling history and telling our histories uh, in a way that we can understand, right? For the first time, representing us to ourselves. Well, you know, George Lamming has a wonderful um, take on those days, and he said he made, he turned history into gossip. <laughs> Everyone needed to know. Everyone had to, as Arnold said, had to be there. And to this day, there are still people who tell me that they, as children, you know, if their parents had, and remember, the, the people who went to these lectures were sort of what, you know, the quote unquote, unwashed, uneducated, because many people did, in Trinidad and Tobago did not go to school after primary school. That was it. And so sometimes you had 20,000 people at the University of Woodford Square. And the lectures began in the Central Library opposite the Woodford Square to uh, you know, select few people. And they became so massive that they had to cross the road and go to the what he then called the University of Woodford Square. And as George Lamming says, he turned the history of the Caribbean into gossip. Everything became news that you had to hear. So Arnold is completely correct. As I said, if people had a car, many people said to me, I, we, we were asleep in the car. Our parents had to drive there and you know park far away and we are asleep in the car and they're listening. And then of course there were others, many others who didn't have cars and they just brought their children to listen to, and this man could talk for hours, you know. I mean, this was not a short, a short and sweet uh, um, exposition. No, 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 no. You're talking hours. And Arnold did say, yes, yeah, he's correct. He had a flair um, for our local, a penchant for our local, what we call pecong, which is, you know, uh, massive teasing <laughs> or a play on words. And that was absolutely a fact. And I think that is how he be, how he, you know, gained his notoriety. Interestingly enough, the, Central Library, which is opposite the University of Woodford Square, where he began, is soon to be the new home of the Eric Williams Memorial Collection, Research Library, Archives, and, and Museum. So historically, it's a perfect place mm -hmm. for that to be you know, situated. I remember that place so, so well. And um, I, I began to think of, of the audacity of Eric Williams. Um, the, you know, the, or audaciousness, however you want to, uh, to, to call it. Um, um, I remember one of the, the truly riveting moments for me in the 50s with Eric Williams is when he engaged in a series of debates with a man known as Don Basil Matthews, who was black himself, a Roman Catholic priest, and an intellectual. Um, and uh, but there was a moment <laughs> where uh, Dr. Williams says, uh, Aristotle says so, 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 but Aristotle was wrong. <laughs> the idea that anybody in Trinidad would say Aristotle was wrong 
What it meant really ultimately was that you are now being invited to offer a criticism of anything that has been handed down to you in the, in the course of, of your colonial education. So maybe Aristotle wasn't wrong, but just to say it and, and to back it up, of course, by, by arguments, uh, that was, that was in, in, a, in some ways the essence of him as, a, as an educator um, at that time, at that moment, that pre-independence, uh, pre-nationalist uh, moment in Trinidad history. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we have lost that now um, for a variety of reasons, but you don't, you're never going to find people, you know, flocking to hear. And these are, as again, university style lectures. He never talked down to people, even though he knew that most of them did not have more than a primary school education and the people understood what he was saying. So I, I think we have lost that art now. I mean, you can't call, let's say a debating society in a university as uh, that's not what happened at the University of Woodford Square. So I, I do think we have, we have completely lost that. It was an incredible experiment at the time in, in decolonizing politics and decolonizing thought um, I think he will, he will always be remembered for that. Um, we talked about this overall legacy, but how do you think your own life's work, uh, each of you, has been influenced by that legacy? I defer. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, long before I even knew it was my legacy, when I was about 14 years old and I was only interested in one thing, boys, boys and more boys, I suddenly said to my father, you know, when you die, I only want one thing. I want your books and papers. I had absolutely no conception what I would do with them. I was a hopelessly ineffectual student, failed at history miserably, but I just knew instinctively that I needed to have this. And when he died, he did leave them to me. And, you know, irony of all, I, in my rebellious years, by the way, I refused to go to university, even if they would have had me, which is doubtful. And um, now irony of all ironies, I'm the founder and curator of, of, again, let me say the EWMC for short, the Eric Williams Memorial Collection Research Library Archives and Museum at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad and Tobago. It was inaugurated in 1998, as you said, Lorraine, by Colin Powell. And um, we are very proud of our achievements. We, um, I always knew that this was, well, no, no, that's not true. At 14, I didn't. But after he died, you know, while he was alive, I studiously ignored his accomplishments, like I suppose most children do. But after he died, I, I, I began to have an appreciation of them. And it was at that time that I, I knew that I wanted to, with his 7,000 plus personal eclectic library, I wanted to have something done with that. Um, obviously I couldn't keep them, the books and papers. Um, like a scholar friend of mine said to me some years ago, Eric Williams's legacy cannot be contained within four walls or behind glass. It must be lived. And he articulated what I instinctively knew all those years before. So the result is, the EWMC, and we not only are a museum, a research library, archives, but we actively are involved in conferences about the man and his work, republication of his books. Um, we have collaborated, this, I'm just giving you a few, uh, university style essay competition in 17 English speaking Caribbean countries. We are involved in a community, uh, community service project, anti-teen pregnancy program in Trinidad and Tobago. We've collaborated with the mayor of London in uh, a series of Eric Williams lectures to commemorate the bicentenary of the Aboli British abolition of the transatlantic slave trade and the University of Sheffield used to have uh, an annual um, uh, postgraduate Caribbean educators program that we also uh, uh, collaborated with. So, and that's just a few of the in initiatives. So it, it is what, what Andrew O'Shaughnessy, who is now the um, director of the Thomas Jeff Jefferson Foundation, what he said to me then about Eric Williams's legacy must be lived, 
that is what I instinctively knew. And that is what we do. It's not just, I did not want, for example, the university has the CLR James collection, the Derek Walcott collection, the Samuel Selvon collection. So you go in there, you want, you're doing some research, you go into the reading room, you do your research, you get the stuff, you go home, you do whatever you have to do with the research. But I did not want, I wanted more than that. We, we are involved in, you know, turning out, churning out other educators. Our first essay competition winner in 2007 is now the Bennett Bosky Fellow in Atlantic Studies at Oxford University. That is why Eric Williams's legacy must be lived. And I just want to say one other thing here. Yes, I'm his daughter, but I am totally aware of both his flaws and his foibles. So this is not a peon to him, but I also recognize that his achievements were quite substantial. That's an understatement. And that they must live. They must, they must, when we, when we have the museum open to students, <clears throat> one, one, we, they go around the museum, which is very small, but they go around the museum and at the end they write in the visitor's book. And when I see Keisha Lewis's little comment, and she was, was a first year UWE student, and she says, keep this signature. I have been inspired to accomplish even greater heights for TNT and the Caribbean. Or I see another child's a high schooler from Trinidad and Tobago, and she says, thank you for treasuring what is truly ours. We've done our job. What a profound ownership of one's history, one's sense of self. I think we did our job. Now, could we improve upon it? Sure. But that's what I wanted to achieve. Thank you, Eric. And is there a lot to do ahead of you? Oh, yes. It never stops. <laughs> it never stops. Thank you. Arnold, what about you as a, as a writer, as a literary critic? How do you think your life's work has been affected? Well, um, I, I'm, I, have, I have no doubt that uh, um, that the, the shadow, as it were, of Eric Williams uh, rested on me. The, the influence was there um, as I struggled to find myself as a, a student, as a scholar um, in my 20s and then early 30s. Um, I, I never thought that I would go to college. Um, I didn't have the, the means to go to college. Um, but then I finally got a break and went to college and uh, got to that point where I discovered that I loved what I was doing. I loved um, working in American literature, but especially in American literature of a certain period, a certain kind, um, certain time, the 19, middle of the 19th century, when, uh, when Americans were truly questioning themselves. When Emerson said uh, to... Uh, uh, in his uh, address to the Phi Beta Kappa Society at Harvard, we have listened too long to the courtly muses of Europe. Uh, when I read that, I think, my God, this is close to what we were saying in 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 in, in Trinidad when I was uh, younger. Um, but then at another at a later point, as I came to write my dissertation, um, <clears throat> I found myself drawn to the whole business of race and literature, race, politics, and the future of black people uh, drawn in a way that clearly, can, you know, drew on my connection to a tradition that in my lifetime was best exemplified, most brilliantly exemplified by Eric Williams. Um, so, I, and I wasn't, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis aware of, of, of the link to us, but uh, a bit link between us in, in that way. But, um, but there's no doubt that it, it, um, it was crucial to me. And just as it was crucial, I think, and I was always very proud that uh, I spent some months, many months of my uh, wandering days in Trinidad before I left and went to Barbados and then on to the United States. Uh, working in the public relations uh, division of the prime minister's office. So I would go up to Whitehall every day and work and help prepare the, the government 
uh, broadcast hour at eight o'clock, along with people like Eunice B uh, Bruno, Aline, and, uh, and 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 others, so, and 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 also that I I interviewed CRR James once, uh, and we ended up being the two Trinidadians who have written books on on Herman Melville. His is a great book. Mine is not, <laughs> but but the the link is there, and I just wanted to to try to locate. Eric Williams in, in a, a broader perspective that takes in a number of really accomplished, brilliant uh, people who have, out of the Caribbean experience, um, brought that uh, sense of conflict, but also of confidence, of, of destiny, uh, to try to shape the political future and cultural future of, uh, of West Indians, and in his case, uh, Trinidadians in, in particular. So I see myself as a as a, a, a student of Williams, um, as a as a, a, a child of Williams almost. Uh, and I was always, I mean, that was where I've, that that is the way I've always seen myself. I never saw myself as a child of Sierra Lord James. He was too rude to me when I met him. <laughs> For me to, or too brusque, I should say, not, not rude. Well, Eric Williams wasn't exactly always polite either. <laughs> well, anyway, anyway, it was it was for me. He he was for me a personal inspiration that was a wonderful counter to the kind of education I received at as a as a schoolboy at St Mary's College. Not to knock the St Mary's College, but one one interesting um, way, and I don't want to be to remain being personal is that uh, at St. Mary's, we um, at, at, the, at, H, at the HC level, advanced level, uh, could not do history. Why? Because I, I think it was because the priests did not want to teach Protestant, what they saw as Protestant history. But history was the very essence of, of Eric Williams. And history was a driving force uh, within all the young men and women who were rising at, at people like Pat Bishop, for example, who were rising at that particular time and were trying to take on the world and hoping to affect it in some positive way. Well, Arnold, you said you didn't want to get too personal, but I'm going to ask you to get uh, more personal, actually. You can't say something like, Eric. Will I was a child of Eric Williams. Uh, and not expect me to want more from you on that score. So I'm going to ask both of you uh, to think. It, it, through our conversation, it's very obvious that it's difficult to separate the politician or the intellectual from our uh, individual and particular memories of Eric Williams. Uh, and a slightly different generation uh, from you two, uh, <laughs> ever so slightly. But he impacted my life tremendously as well in terms of educational policies and impacted uh, you know, the life of my parents. Um, so in many cases, when we think about memories of Eric Williams, those memories can feel very personal, but they tend to resonate uh, more widely. They resonate collectively uh, and socially. If, uh, if I were to ask my father, for example, for his most salient recollection of Eric Williams, um, he would probably choose to remember the Eric Williams of the March in the Rain, right? The, the, the march to demand that the US cede the land that the British had leased to them in Shagaramas during World War II. And for my father, that act of exactly what I was thinking of audacity, as you mentioned, Arnold, uh, was experienced as part of a very personal process of subject formation. His, his coming into adulthood as a, a, a young Caribbean male. Um, but it was also a coming into being of, of a, a very different kind of political subject and a feeling that you were taking your place uh, in history. So I wanted to ask uh, the two of you uh, to get personal or to continue to get even more personal and ask Erica as his daughter, as you just uh, to us about the, the, the labor uh, of conserving and, and disseminating his, his legacy. Uh, you must have a very um, personal recollection, a very keen sense of how personal recollection uh, often overlaps with what his national, regional, international history of, of decolonization. 
And I wondered if you had a, a story uh, to share with us about a moment or an incident uh, when you realized that he was more than your father or that you were sharing your father uh, with the nation, uh, with, with the Caribbean and, and well beyond. And that, well, I'm going to ask this question sitting with Arnold while Eric is, is answering. Arnold, I, I would love for you to answer the question in a slightly different way as a Caribbean intellectual yourself as a celebrated biographer with its gift for zeroing in on the most notable moments of people's lives. Uh, what would you choose to open with if you were to narrativize or memorialize Eric Williams' life in a biography? Erica. Well, first of all, before I get there, I wanna talk about audacity. Um, in 1975, you know, I, Eric Williams, although of rather short stature, was too big to be small. And I'll give you an anecdote. In 1975, we went to Russia, the USSR. And we went to Moscow first, and then uh, Kiev, and uh, and um, while we were in Moscow, and you know, the Russians are not exactly noted for their tact. While we were in Moscow, they kept haranguing him to sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty then and there in Moscow so that they could come out with a joint communique. Now it's not that Trinidad and Tobago didn't want to sign it. Actually, they signed it 20 years later, but he kept saying to them, this is not my purview. This is the purview of the government and people and parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. So I can sign nothing and I will sign nothing. Well, my God, they went on. They offered a ride for him on the presidential plane. They offered to take him fishing with Brezhnev. I mean, this man had, the only thing re relation to a fish he had ever had was on his plate. So they offered to take him fishing with Brezhnev. They even said, they start, after all the blandishments did not work. And you know, the thing is they didn't do their homework. They didn't do their homework as to who this man was. So anyway, after all the blandishments didn't work, they then started to get insulting. You in Trinidad and Tobago, you should just stick to what you all do best, which is Calypso and Steel Band. Oh God, why say that to Eric Williams? Not good, not good. So Kosygin, who would later, you know, he was foreign minister at the time, he would later climb the ladder of, of, of Soviet, um, uh, you know, whatever privilege <clears throat> he had a lunch for the delegation and eric williams sat at the lunch he turned the chair the back of the chair to the table and he read a book for the entire lunch he didn't say a word he refused to speak any further while we were in moscow not a word if somebody addressed him he would the russians nothing he sat and turned his back to the table and read a book. Meantime, the delegation is only thinking that Siberia is looming. <laughs> but that was the audacity. You are not going to think that because I come from a small country that we don't have a voice. You cannot you know, either persuade us or force us to do something that we are not going to do period. So that was, that's what I think about when I, when I think about audacity and I was there. So I knew the other thing is you mentioned about um, what, what personal story, I'm sorry, what did you say? Something? As well as a flair for the theatrical. No? Oh yes. Oh, absolutely. Cor correct. Just what Arnold had, had described. And you asked me about the personal memory that I might have or story about when I knew I had to share, uh, to share him with the with the nation. I think that had to be when he died. Uh, when he died, he died very suddenly. And when he died, I was in Miami. I flew to Trinidad the very next day. It was so shocking. So uh, to, to the public that people who were driving their cars, it reminds me of when Obama was elected, people who were driving their cars when they heard the news on the radio, they stopped their cars, got out and literally cried. This was huge. And so anyway, long story short, um, 
the government, after I arrived in Trinidad, the government wanted me to agree to a state funeral, um, complete with gun courage, parade, the, the regiment, the police, the Coast Guard. And my father had always asked me to vow that he would not, that I would not agree to any kind of commemoration, any statue, no honor, no tribute when he died. And I agreed. So I said, absolutely not. No gun carriage, no uh, state procession, nothing. So when I got to the funeral home, but I did agree that he could lie in state at the Red House, which is, was, is and was the seat of our parliament and government, and in fact has been so for more than 100 years. So I agreed to that. And the reason why I agreed to that was because I understood the complete and total shock of the people. And I understood that even in death, although he had given a quarter century of his life, which was way too long, to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, I understood that he owed, still owed them something. He owed them an opportunity to pay their respects and to say goodbye. So it was on that basis that I countermanded his wishes and agreed to that. Well, the government tricked me. So I get to the funeral home and to, to ride in the hearse to the Red House. And there I see the gun carriage, the police, the Redman, Coast Guard, all in formation, all with black armbands. So I said to the gun carriage, I said, no, that's not happening. Simple hearse. But I could not say to the men and women who had waited there in the hot sun for hours in formation, well, you, you can't do your duty. So the hearse was in front and the procession followed. And there, I cannot even begin to describe the throngs of people that lined every single street that we passed by. And one of the things that really hit me like a ton of bricks, you know, we are a noisy people in Trinidad and Tobago. We are an, are an irreverent people in Trinidad and Tobago. You could have heard a pin drop. It was total and complete silence. All you heard was, I don't know, there was a regiment, police band or whatever, a drum intermittently. That was all, nothing else, nobody jostling, nobody calling out, nothing, total silence. So we get to the Red House, he lies in state. And at the time, a quarter of the population of Trinidad and Tobago filed past his bear. And then at the first day, the crowds outside began to shout, no face, no vote. Meaning we don't be, they, they didn't believe that he was dead. It was just so sudden. They didn't believe he was dead and they were not going to believe he was dead unless they saw his face. Now he had requested a closed casket as was my wish. And I was not going to uh, move on that. So we continued with the closed casket and they asked me, there was literally going to be a riot. There were riot police there and so on. So they asked me if I would address the nation and I did. And it seemed to calm the people somewhat. But it was then that I realized that Eric Williams didn't just belong to me or his family, he belonged to the nation. And in fact, thereafter, the people dubbed him as even still today, the father of the nation. So that was a very concrete example of when I understood that whatever he had said to me and I had vowed to him had to be changed, had to be modified again because of the people. And he did not just belong to his family. Thank you, Eric, and that's very moving. And that need to commemorate, uh, obviously, his desire not to be monumentalized, not to be remembered in a certain way, uh, didn't take into account. Um, and he said that publicly, too. He mm -hmm. said that publicly. So people knew that he had said that. But I, I just had to go against those wishes in that particular context. Yeah, understood. We had our own family morning and I'm sure it was happening all over the country at the time. I remember being woken up uh, before dawn by my parents telling us we have terrible news. Dr. Williams is dead. But you know, it's a moment that sort of marks you. And thank you for sharing that. It's, it's very moving. I'm going to recompose myself while Arnold <laughs> tells us. Well, well, I recompose myself after, after what Erica has said, that, because it's so um, so moving. Um, and, and of course, it stirs the biography in me, wanting those 
to 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 fasten on those details you know that that make from my from my point of view uh the the, the true story of the life you know the little the so-called little things uh, incidents uh, often glossed over by by writers and by people who don't know better but um but all of all of the uh, of items all the items such as, as as this one i mean go into uh true understanding if, insofar as we can really understand eric williams from this distance um our understanding of the man who yeah was the father of the the, the country certainly i regarded him as as i said just now as as a uh, an intellectual father in a way that I never regarded my own father, um, even though he he worked for the for the nation for for some time with uh, CLR uh, under um, Eric Williams, and um, uh, I was interested too when you mentioned the Shiraamas struggle, um, how how personal that was for me because my mother had worked as a telephone operator for the americans uh, the naval uh, um, the army to from the 1940s on to the cl closing down of the base um uh, so i had a sense that here was someone um who was taking the long view of the american presence in in um, in trinidad of Chagaramas, uh who saw the importance uh, of um of that land that being returned to the, to the people of Trinidad. I mean, somebody who was clearly looking out for us short term and long term, long term in a way that I didn't think anybody else was looking out for us. Anybody, any uh, political person on the on, on the scene. Um, uh, I, I, I think of um, uh, Many things, many many sort of thoughts and phrases pop into my head uh, when I think about Eric Williams. Um, I, I I came up at one point with a sense of of reverence for what I would call his profound humility. I mean, it, because I think it was uh, an act, a sustained act of humility, to devote himself and his energies and his life force to dealing with the the you know the absolute mess in some respects that it must have been to um to control uh, shape trinidad the, the destiny the internal and, and, and objective destiny of trinidad it must have been just draining and and killing almost um and i think he was sustained by by the depth of his mind and the depth of his training uh, the depth of his sense of obligation. So, and I think that in that regard, he would have, he has to be seen as somebody who was humble, but at the same time, it was a profound sense of humility. I mean, the idea that you go back to Trinidad and you're looking around for statues, you know, um, and I mean, you fall back on the on the Latin, Latin business of uh, if you want a monument, look around you. Uh, now he, there's a lot of stuff in Trinidad that nobody would want to take credit for. Um, but if you want to, you know, a monument to Eric Williams, just look around you in the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, they have how they have struggled, but how also how they have triumphed, how they have succeeded, um, especially in the context the the same. Um, so, I mean, that's the way I see Eric Williams. Um, and um, uh, and I, I I mean I will forever see him in in that way. You. you know, uh, just just one other thing in terms of you know when they were commemorating the one hundredth anniversary of the Red House being the seat of government and Parliament, they asked me. They told me that they would like the the Speaker of Parliament told me he would like to put a bust of Eric Williams in Parliament. Well, I was horrified wanted to know if I would approve of it. And I said, well, I can't stop you doing what you want to do, but it's ridiculous. I said, the only thing a bus does is give the cleaners something more to dust. That does absolutely nothing. I said, bus, if anybody does look at it, are they going to know who Eric Williams was or what he did or what, what he aspired to? I said, absolutely not. Why don't you just put a plaque? of his words that mean something. 
Well, happily, the speaker was so gracious. And we had a, a ceremony on the unveiling of the plaque. I spoke in the parliament and I, they asked me, well, what should we put? And so this is what I said. His words that he uttered in 1979, well, he, he wrote it actually, and it's also in his, one of his books, build the nation of Trinidad and Tobago, bringing in all the races, acknowledging all their contributions, elevating lowly castes, dignifying despised colors, achieving a syncretism here and a new autonomy there, raising up the poor and the lowly and giving them a positive stake in our society. The humblest antecedents are not inconsistent with greatness of soul. That every time I say that or read that, I get goose flesh. Now, do you really think a bust of Eric Williams would have done that? No, absolutely not. So that is in the parliament and thank God they agreed. So and I can't, I didn't feel that I was, uh, you know, contravening his orders about no commemoration. Those were his words. And again, Andrew O'Shaughnessy, his legacy, so sorry, his legacy must be lived. Mm -hmm. So you've been sharing him with the nation even after his death, clearly. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Legacy must be lived. And part of that, you have it there in, in some of the words on that plaque, um, uh, points me to, you know, to, to be the most unfortunate thing about Eric Williams, um, the extent to which some people, many people in Trinidad see him in terms of divisiveness, of a you know, spirited kind of uh, champion of one part of Trinidad against the others. Whereas from the beginning, I mean, for me, it was very clear he was speaking to everyone and his sense of Trinidad was a unified uh, sense. Um, he did not want to pit one against another. Um, I mean, I think that the, the, the record is very clear on that subject. And the sadness was that, you know, that you couldn't get the most of Trinidad, apparently, to go along with that vision of themselves, you know, but he did what he could. And uh, so he remains to me a, a heroic figure, um, heroic for several things, but most of all for this business of trying to, to make Trinidad truly one and, and, and uh, in which nobody, no, no group, no class, no ethnicity is subjugated by, by, by others. And uh, the fact that, as I said, that, that uh, not everyone could follow him or will, would follow him in, in, this, uh, in this sense of, of the wholeness of, uh, and the unity of Trinidad, that's, that's unfortunate, but that is, that's, that's, that's the world. Right? That's the world. It's called politics, unfortunately. <laughs> and politics, we're seeing it here in the United States right now. And I, I, I submit respectfully that politics is not always good politics in quote, quote unquote, is not always good for the people. But talk, going back to Arnold's uh, notion, not notion, but his belief that Eric Williams was a unifier, if I may, this is what he said to the nation on the eve of independence. Together, the various groups in Trinidad and Tobago have suffered. Together, they have aspired. Together, they have achieved. And only together can they succeed. And only together can they build a, a society. Can they build a nation? Can they build a homeland? There can be no mother India for those whose ancestors came from India. There can be no mother Africa for those of African origin. There can be no mother England and no dual loyalties. There can be no mother China, even if one could agree as to which China is the mother. And there can be no mother Syria and no mother Lebanon. A nation like an individual can have only one mother. The only mother we recognize is mother Trinidad and Tobago and mother cannot discriminate between her children. And that, of course, for, for, for viewers, listeners, is because Trinidad and Tobago was and remains a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious society. When Eric Williams went to Africa in 1964, 
Um, and he did a lot to help them build their civil service. He, he sent people from Trinidad and Tobago to assist. Africa, he, he kept on saying everywhere he went, he, he, he spoke to university students and he had to let the Africans know, the Africans thought that once we became independent, that Trinidad and Tobago would vote with them on every, on every aspect, every subject, every topic in the United Nations. And he had to tell them unequivocally, Trinidad, and this is documented, Trinidad and Tobago is not an African country. So don't expect us. Our, our aims and objectives may diverge with yours. Do not just anticipate that we will always vote with Africa or indeed with India or indeed with anybody else. We are a sovereign nation. We will vote our own interests. I think the comments of both of you now are really pointing to that, uh, those dual gifts he had of, of this fierce nationalism. Uh, along with this, uh, this particular vocation for, for reading global flows, for understanding our place in, in the flow of history and politics um, internationally. So I think there's this breadth to his vision, as Arnold said, sort of thinking the nation and its future, but all the time uh, thinking the nation in the context of, of world history, right? And the, the, the political, the economic scenarios. Um, of the time. And I, I like that quote from Franklin W. Knight that said he was from Trinidad, but he belonged to the entire Caribbean and the wider world. Um, this idea that really this is somebody um, with a loftiness of vision uh, and an ambition to his vision to which we, we still aspire, right? It's not a, a complete project by any means and, and never will be. So there's a sort of gauntlet that he throws down to us. I think, uh, in terms of continuing um, to aspire towards those very lofty ideals. Um, I wanted to, to close our conversation just to talk a little bit um, about the Eric Williams Memorial Lecture. Uh, Eric, you and Carol Boyce Davies uh, organized this lecture for nearly 20 years. Carol, of course, is a distinguished professor of Africana studies at Cornell currently. She was at Florida International University when you two conceived of this series. Um, it brought an impressive number and range of leaders and artists, um, intellectuals from across the diaspora. It was always conceived as a, a diasporic project, I think. Um, Arnold was one of the speakers, I think, in 2008. You delivered the 10th lecture about the challenge of leadership in America, race history, and the emergence of Barack Obama. Um, so I want to ask you, Erica, and, and then you, Arnold, that this event is, is coming to UT, and we're very excited uh, that it will be here officially next year. We're launching it uh, through this series of interviews and conversations. What does that lecture mean to you, uh, Erica? And, and both of you, what role do you think an event like this plays in understanding enduring persistent issues or urgent issues uh, in the African diaspora today? Well, you know, this, this lecture happened. And as I said, we at FIU, Florida International University, we actually did 19 consecutive annual lectures. And I had heard that um, the, there was a Trini, Trini, Trinidadian, Carol Boyce Davies, who was the director of African and African New World Studies, as it was dubbed at the time at FIU. So I thought, well, let me call her up. I don't know who she is. Well, let me call her up and, you know, introduce myself and see how we can collaborate. And we had lunch and that was the genesis of the lecture, 19 consecutive years. And even after Carol skipped town and left to go to Cornell, it continued. And we were very clear about the aim of the lecture. Our constituency, which we manage, we, we, we um, emphasize to every speaker was a lay one. Yes, we got some professors from, yes, we got students from FIU and other schools in the surrounding areas, but it was a lay audience. And in that, my idea was, this is, in a sense, a continuation of the University of Woodford Square lectures, where he spoke to the people. 
And at first we didn't um, have a Q and A after the lecture, but eventually we did. And I'm telling you the lay people there, you know, again, irreverent our Caribbean people. They don't care if you have the alphabet after your name. <laughs> they are, if they have something to say, they're getting up and they're saying it and they're challenging you. And that made for an interchange of, of, of ideas. It was incredible. So I, I really think that we, you know, we began the lectures again because of we wanted to continue this, um, you know, uh, uh, idea Eric Williams's idea of academic investigation and analysis. We wanted to uh, raise the consci consciousness of the Caribbean lay community in respect of their roots and for their intellectual upliftment. And we wanted to kind of copy the idea behind the University of Woodford Square that we are speaking to lay people. And this is not just to academics. And honestly, all of us, I know, and, and I think also this is one of the reasons why if we have had, if I have had some personal success with the EWMC, it is because I am not a scholar. We all know that we have uh, gone to, let's say conferences and they have six people in the audience, five of them sleeping. So <laughs> we, <laughs> well, you know, this is true. And obviously you all are both laughing. So you, you, you acknowledge that, right? And so because I am not a scholar, I always want things to be exciting. And like people would say um, lots of times, oh, at the FIU lecture, we, we must choose someone who's not controversial. I said, hell no, we want to choose people who are going to be controversial. That, again, you, we want excitement, we want enlightenment, we want controversy, we want, you know, you need to poke them, poke people into thinking and, and, and feeling. So that's really what we aim to do. Well, I was, I was thinking um, about um, something else that uh, Dr. Williams said around 1962, um, uh, which is the time of that, uh, that uh, speech uh, that uh, uh, Erica alluded to, um, that shows to me at least, suggests to me how, how essential in his vision, the world of um, scholarship was to, uh, you know, to everyday life, to a, an understanding of the world around Jesus. He said, he told the, his audience, and I think it was mainly school children, uh, uh, but I remember sort of recoiling when he said it or, or coming to, springing to attention. He said, the future of either Trinidad or, or a nation is in your school bags. I was profoundly moved by, by that statement. And so when you have, you know, many, many uh, decades later, uh, Eric Williams being memorialized in particular, um, not with statues in Trinidad or rena the renaming of an airport or anything like that, but by a collection of, of, of his books by lectures that combine the popular with the educational. Uh, that seems to me just, just perfect. And I can only hope that that work continues uh, in perpetuity, really. Thank you. Quote that, the quote that Arnold is alluding to is when he spoke to the children of the nation on the eve of independence. And this is what he said, you children, Yours is the great responsibility to educate your parents. Teach them to live together in harmony. To your tender and loving hands, the future of the nation is entrusted. In your innocent hearts, the pride of the nation is enshrined. On your scholastic development, the salvation of the nation is dependent. You carry the future of Trinidad and Tobago in your school bags. That's a perfect place to end. Thank both of you for your time. I want to thank you for an enlightening, sometimes emotional conversation, I think for all concerned. And we are just thrilled to have this event come to, to UT Austin and we look forward to launching it with an in-person, hopefully large and rambunctious public lecture along the lines that Erica likes uh, next spring. Thank you so much, Erica Williams-Connell and Professor Arnold Rappersard. <laughs>